Okay, thank you. I thought we were having a discussion first, so... No, at the end. Uh, okay. The end. Um, so my goal in the next uh, 12 minutes is to distill a book which itself was a distillation of about uh, 20 years of research <laughs> and uh, working in multiple countries and languages and using, uh, uh, among other things, well over 300 personal accounts. Um, so I will just give a gist of uh, some of the outlines of the book and then some of the conclusions that I uh, think I can draw from that. M the main question that I had to myself a long time ago in the 1990s was the question of the intimacy of uh, genocide. And the main uh, argument at the time about genocide, which remains in many places, was to think of genocide, particularly the Holocaust, as one in which the killing was mechanized, was created in a way to have distance between the perpetrators and the victims, um, which the, the epitome of that was the extermination camp, uh, that you can transport a population from one place uh, in Europe to another place where their killing is compartmentalized so that no one in particular sees all the stages of the killing, and no one in particular is directly responsible for any, for the entire operation. Uh, and so I, I ask myself, what happens on the local level? Uh, and as we know now, of course, uh, half of the victims of the Holocaust were not killed uh, in extermination camps, but were killed where they lived. Uh, and so in order to um, investigate that, I chose one town in Eastern Europe. It had to be Eastern Europe because Eastern Europe was where most of the Jews lived and where most of the Jews were murdered. And I chose a particular town, the town of Buchach in now Western Ukraine, it used to be in Eastern Galicia, before that was in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, I, I chose it for a variety of reasons. Uh, there were interesting people who came from that town. I won't get into that now. And also because my mother came from there. And so I thought I might as well take a town that I had some of my own intimate connection to, uh, and, um, and as I said, my initial question was, what happens in the encounter between the perpetrator and the victim? Is there a recognition of humanity in that encounter uh, where it is one-on-one? -on -one? Um, so in 1995, I, for the first time in my life, interviewed my mother about her own childhood, and when she told me about her childhood growing up in, in uh, Bucha, she left in 1935 when she was 11. Uh, she talked about growing up in a Yiddish-speaking home, uh, studying in a Polish-language school, and speaking Ukrainian on the street with her girlfriends. Uh, and so thinking about that interview, I, which was she never mentioned that, like Semitism, hatred, anything of that sort. She had a nice, fond childhood. And as I said, she was 11 when she left. Um, Thinking about that, it occurred to me that my original question was insufficient, that in fact, it was not only the encounter between the perpetrator and the victim, it was also what was the social reality into which the perpetrators came and to what extent that social reality had an effect on the manner in which genocide was perpetrated in that local uh, site. Now, of course, that's a one case, but Buchach is representative of hundreds of such towns, which were towns of mixed population for hundreds of years. In uh, Buchach, the first uh, gravestones in the Jewish cemetery date back to the 16th century, and that's quite typical of this area. There were Poles there, and there were Ruthenians, Ukrainians there too. So um, this was the sort of general outline. Now, I'll give you just a little bit on the on the core of my findings and then some conclusions. Um, so the first half of the book is about all that prehistory, pre which is really important, but I'm not gonna talk about it here. Hopefully you'll ask me about it a, a bit later. Um, but in, in Buchach, after the first wave of killings that we just heard about, and there was such a thing also in Buchach, um, between um, late um, summer, or early fall of 1942, and early summer of 1943, uh, 10,000 Jews are killed in Buchach, uh, and the local uh, outpost of, this, of the German security police, which is in Chortkiv nearby, uh, kills altogether in that area 60,000 Jews. 
most of them in that short period of time. Now, that outpost is made up of between 20 and 30 Germans. Not all of them are German, in fact. Some are ethnic German from Poland, from uh, Lithuania, from Czechoslovakia. Um, th these 20 to 30 men have a very good time there. I won't get into that. They bring their wives, their children. It's a very nice time for them there. In fact, the best time of their lives. But when they are not having a good time boozing and uh, um, uh, having sex and so forth, uh, they're killing Jews in large numbers. Now, they're very thin on the ground, obviously, and so they cannot do that on their own. Uh, the way they can kill so many people is that they have an, an auxiliary police battalion in Trotkiv, uh, which numbers about 350 men. These men are um, uh, local Ukrainians. Many of them belong or had belonged to the siege that, was, uh, that arose in Buchach immediately uh, as the Soviets were leaving, made up of about 100 men. Uh, the commanders are former members of the OUN, whose records exist for the 1930s, Polish police records. You and to explain the siege? The, the siege, it's, it's, well, it, I, I won't get into the etymology of the name, but it's basically a militia. So it's a local militia that is organized on the ground there uh, by a Ukrainian uh, commanded by um, a former own activists, and they recruit local boys from uh, nearby towns and villages. Uh, that body is converted by the Germans as the Germans settle in into an auxiliary police force. Other members are made into local police forces. There are local German police forces, local Ukrainian police forces, and in towns that have a Jewish council, there's also a local Jewish police force. Those forces are those that facilitate killing on such a large scale. That is, they round up people, they bring them to the killing sites or to the train station, and then they're either deported to Bezhet, which is the designated extermination camp, or they're killed on the spot. More than half of the people who are killed in this area are killed on the spot. So in Buchach, about 7,000 people are killed right there on two hills on both sides of the town. Hundreds of them are killed on the street in the process of rounding people up. And they're still there. The mass graves are still there. Um, this is followed uh, in um, January, uh, as of January 1944, with mass violence between Poles and Ukrainians. The uh, uh, UPA comes down, the Ukrainian insurgent army uh, comes down from Volhynia and begins um, cleansing of uh, Polish villages in the area. This is not to say the Poles don't retaliate. There's a lot of uh, violence also by Polish organizations, but the proportion of uh, Polish victims is much higher. And in fact, the Germans in that area assist Poles in escaping that area into the heartland of Poland. Um, so this is the sort of um, scale of events. Now, what has to be understood is that most of the killing occurs about a year after the Germans arrive. And therefore, in that year, uh, the Germans get to know the Jews quite well. Uh, they use them as their babysitters, as their maids, as their tailors, as their dentists, uh, uh, mechanics, whatever it is. And they get to know many of them by name. And many of the Ukrainians who participate later on in rounding up Jews and often in killing them are people who know the people they're killing. They know them personally. They know them by name. Often their children have gone to school together. They had studied together. So the killing is extremely intimate, which is one reason that when you read Jewish accounts or Jewish testimonies afterwards, uh, in those accounts, um, um, surviving Jews speak in particularly bitterly about their Ukrainian neighbors because these were people they knew. And these were people they feel who betrayed them. Uh, I should say about the aftermath very quickly that um, all this history is basically deleted from the local memory. There are some memorials that are put up after the war. Those are removed by the Soviets shortly thereafter. Uh, there are um, very few signs of there ever having been a Jewish population there unless there's a remaining uh, synagogue. In the case of Butchaj, the synagogue was demolished and transformed into a very elegant uh, kino theater. 
uh, and, and there's no, no mention that there was a synagogue. The last remaining Jewish edifice there was bulldozed in 2001 by the local mayor to create a shopping center. Uh, there, there, there are no signs anywhere. Uh, in the gymnasium, the Jewish past of the town is not taught. Uh, and so people have to find out about that from other sources, but not from the local source. So let me just, uh, how long have I got? I have two minutes. So I'll just um, give you some of my very quick uh, conclusions from all this. Uh, one is that the genocidal encounter between perpetrators and victims on the local level was intimate. It was not detached. So it's a very different picture of what we have of the Holocaust, that both victims and perpetrators were known and were not anonymous. The killing was public and was not secret. The category of bystander, by and large, disappears in these places. No one is uninvolved. Everyone is involved to one degree or another. There's nobody simply watching from their windows. People have to do something, and it's on a range between complete participation in the killing to helping and sheltering people. Most people are someplace on that range. That often the victims of one round of violence became perpetrators of another. I can say much more about it, but in this slightly longer stretch, if we go from 1939, from the Soviet presence, uh, um, people have different roles. And often uh, people who are in the police in one role are being victimized by the police in another role. Uh, that you can understand the nature of the event on the local level only if you take a longer view of it. If you go back in history to understand why relations are as they are and why people think of each other in such categories. Uh, otherwise, it's very hard to understand. The Germans didn't care about it, of course, at all. But the way it worked out uh, had to do with that longer history. That you have to rely on personal accounts for much of this. And historians who have neglected those have not been able to actually reconstruct what happened on the ground. Those who said that, well, these are testimonies, these are subjective accounts. Um, you cannot reconstruct much of what happened without those subjective accounts, so to speak. And there's no reason to think that Gestapo documents are more accurate than uh, uh, someone speaking about it in 1947. Um, that all groups involved perceive themselves as victims. And, and that is a perception that existed before, existed during, and remained afterwards. There is a very strong sense that you were victims, and not only that you were victims, but you were victims particularly of your neighbors, of those you knew, because the outside forces uh, play a different role. You have no intimate relationship with them, but your, your neighbors, and that your neighbors' profit somehow would have been your loss. So anytime you see that your neighbors are doing somewhat better in terms of power, in terms of material wealth, that means that you are losing out. Um, and then finally, that this view that we have, and I think has, has um, grown in recent years, of Eastern Europe as being the zone in which two titanic forces were fighting against each other. And so all the populations in this zone, the bloodlands, uh, were basically victims of Stalin and Hitler. If you look, if you zoom in, you realize that much of what was happening, much of the violence uh, was different. It had to do with that, of course. It was necessary to have that. But apart from that, many of the agendas, uh, much of the violence was triggered from within and had to do with something very separate from the German or Soviet agendas. Thanks.